Well, hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Lundeen. There it is. I'm with LBG Real Estate Companies, and I'm going to be moderating the next panel. Now, we have to apparently get back on schedule, so, and I'm going to try to have questions at the end, um, but we only have about 50 minutes, and we have a huge, huge topic that we have to cover. We're going to be covering basically all the different flavors of crowdfunding. Uh, and I wanted to try to do a real quick demographic survey, but half the crowd is outside, but with whoever's here. <laughs> um, so who here actually has uh, participated actively in crowdfunding in the past? Okay, and so your sponsors, you've raised money through the crowd? Um, okay, and, and who is interested as a sponsor in raising money through the crowd? Okay, so more, the, the majority. So you're interested and you're trying to figure out which way to go because it's really confusing, which it is. And, you know, the, I, I was going to do a legal disclaimer at the beginning of this, but I think that whole last panel was a big legal disclaimer. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to, which was a great panel. It was a great panel, but there were a lot of warnings there and it could scare you away and I don't want you to be scared away. So, because I think I've, I've raised money through the crowd and I really thought it was a good process and it's definitely still in its infancy and I did it 18 months ago and it's still in its infancy, but I think, you know, we're all going to talk about our experience with crowdfunding and uh, try to help you out and have some time to answer questions at the end. So again, my name is Leslie Lundin. I'm with LBG Real Estate Companies. We're an owner operator of shopping centers. We basically buy shopping centers, do value add plays, mainly in the Western US. And our typical equity check is about five to $10 million, which is a little big for the crowd, um, but we're gonna talk about sizes. And I'm just gonna go down the line and have all the panelists do a quick introduction and just talk briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, about your experience with the crowd. And then we're gonna get into pricing and structure and that sort of thing. So, Greg? So I'm probably a little bit different on the panel. Um, my name is Greg Hebner. I'm a partner managing director in Arixa Capital, which is one of the largest uh, specialty lenders here in California, primarily focused on residential construction. Um, we, uh, my background also is I've been a developer of single family residential properties. I've done about 250 projects where we've purchased, renovated, torn down, or rebuilt homes, mostly in coastal California. Uh, we basically manage a number of commingled, um, feels kind of old school among this audience, old school uh, real estate funds, uh, all accredited investors, um, you know, hundreds of investors who have sort of you know, hundred to $200,000 minimum investments as opposed to some of the numbers we heard. In our, and we primarily are making first trustee debt investments to professional real estate investors who are mostly doing this uh, as a profession. Um, so. I come from a technology background. I was a CEO and ran a number of technology companies until the housing crisis. And now I kind of feel like uh, technology has moved ahead of me a little bit and a lot of things are happening quite different. Our, we have a lot of borrowers who use the crowd um, for the mez and the junior, uh, the equity behind our deals. So there's definitely, uh, we see that on a number of deals. We've looked at a lot of the term sheets as it relates to some of the platforms who sat behind our debt. Um, but, it's, you know, we, we probably provide a very similar product to what Jason would provide and, you know, so we're probably more competitive with some of the crowdfunding platforms in terms of, you know, I could probably provide a little bit of a sense of what maybe our borrowers are seeing versus using the crowd because we're, you know, we're still, I think we're kind of, I'd call it kind of old fashioned crowd. It's still a lot of individual people and we're still matching it up with individual borrowers and individual investments. But, you know, we probably haven't embraced maybe the same level of technology and things that some of our other panelists have, but we are certainly seeing more and more activity from our clients who, especially on the equity side, are very attracted to the access to capital and the ability to really bring down their cost of funds. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Fritton. I'm the executive chairman and co-founder of Patch of Land. Uh, we are an alternative marketplace lender and crowdfunding company that specializes in what we consider to be the bones of real estate. Um, the fix and flip on single family residential, small multifamily, mid-sized multifamily. We've since been expanding out into some more of the smaller cash flow and commercial opportunities, but realistically that's, that, that's not our particular specialty. Um, we've got a crowd of about 20,000 uh, registered accredited, uh, of which about 15% are, are active. Our, our crowd on average will do 
about 12 investments with us on, uh, per year. And our borrowers were generally uh, borrowed two to three times per year uh, a piece. Um, so we're active in about 46 states now. Um, there's, there's four that, that we're really not active in because of licensing and registration. My particular experience with uh, is like Greg in, in tech. Um, I came from a tech background. I worked a lot with government military. I built a $30 million a year company from there and lost it overnight in the, uh, the financial collapse. Um, and I, I really started Patch simply because I saw that this is the direction that finance is really taking, to be able to coordinate and aggregate the, the experiential skill sets and the resources of a huge amount of previous and unrelated people and be able to focus them on something that, that would normally be very difficult for an individual person to do. And we've had a, a great deal of success with that. Hi, I'm Julian Hellman, and I'm the CEO of RealtyMogul.com, and we're the largest crowdfunding platform for commercial real estate. Uh, we've got over 80,000 investors. We've invested north of $200 million in capital uh, raised from the crowd. And we focus exclusively on commercial real estate. So the majority of what we do is the big food groups, apartment, office, retail, industrial. We've also done some work in self-storage and, and mobile home parks as well. And we have four key products. We have two debt products and two equity products. Our debt products are senior debt, which is a bridge loan. Uh, mezzanine debt, so we'll sit behind a first lender, usually a bank or an insurance company. We don't sit behind CMBS very often. And then on the equity side of the business, we have a preferred equity product where we will finance up to 85% of the capital stack. And we have a joint venture equity product where we will finance up to 90% of the capital stack. Uh, yeah. So my, my name is uh, Jonathan Chang. Uh, I'm the director of investments at Pacific Castle. Uh, we're owner operators. We have about a billion AUM. Uh, under management right now. Um, so we've used uh, crowdfunding twice, I think, on, on two different deals, one recently. Um, and we have, you know, the, the, the equity that we get is, we actually go through a pretty wide spectrum. Um, we go, we have active JVs with Prudential, PREI, Inland, and a couple of different big equity shops. And then you run your gamut of obviously family offices, high net worth individuals. Um, but we only focus on retail, um, so we only buy shopping centers. Um, our assets are all along, up and down the West Coast, um, anywhere from a $10 million asset up to $150 million, give or take. Okay, so Jonathan and I, we're kind of similar, right? We're, we're yeah. both, we both raise money through the crowd, and then you have your crowds already, and, and you have capital that you're putting out. So just so you understand where we are on the spectrum. Now, if you're a sponsor, and let's say you want to raise, you know, two, three million dollars in the crowd, you're going to have choices, right? You could just, you could go to Jillian, and you could say, you know, Jillian has already potentially pooled the money, and she could just write a check. Or you could do kind of what I did, which is we went to a platform, and it's basically um, their marketing for us, and they just expanded. We went to Real Crowd, and they basically just expanded our network, but. I controlled the money, the escrow, you know, the, the escrow was controlled by me. Nobody touched the money except me, like a typical syndication. So there's different ways you could do it. You could also do white label where, and I don't know if you want to, Jonathan, talk about your experience as well. You could do a white label where you could pay one of the platforms to basically put a plug in on your own website where that goes to their website and you could use your own network but just effectively use the internet. Um, did I miss anything <laughs> other ways of doing it? So we chose to go with a real crowd type platform for ours because I am a control freak and I was a lender for 20 years and I want to make sure that I control the money and I control the message. Um, there, I also, we also have experience with institutional investing, institutional investors, fund partners, and our own syndication network. And we wanted to get away from having one partner. Therefore, we didn't choose a platform which would effectively write a check which was obviously more cumbersome. Um, Jonathan, what were you, where did you end up doing? Yeah, so we've done, I think it's two or three deals, I can't remember anymore, but um, we've done them all with Realty Shares. Uh, we looked at Realty Mogul and all the other platforms as well. Um, one deal we purchased about two years ago, I think they raised, I think it was like 300,000. Um, so for us, for our company in particular, we do have quite a few different sources of equity we can go to. So to be frank, crowdfunding doesn't play a huge role in how we raise equity. Um, for us, it's more kind of a supplementation and kind of um, time. It saves us time, essentially. 
if someone can come in with you know a quarter million, half a million, or a million dollar check on these smaller deals we buy sometimes, it frankly just saves us a couple of phone calls to to make to the investors. Um, so for us, you know, um, w with uh, Realty Shares when we did it, um, they basically raised, they go to their investors, they form the single purpose vehicle, and they invest via their LLC, um, which is preferably, I, I know it's different than how Leslie did it. For us, it just makes more sense to do it that way because I don't, our, frankly, we don't want 25 investors coming in at $25,000 each or something like that where we have to, it's kind of brain damage for us to cut all the checks and you know, these, frankly, they're the ones gonna be who are asking more questions on a day-to-day -day basis, which we're happy to answer, but it just takes away from what we're truly trying to do, which is buying properties for the investors and maintaining the properties and kind of building their equity line instead of asking, having, answering questions all the time. Um, so we just did a deal with Realty Shares again out in Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, I think they raised half a million dollars um, We've only had the property for about eight months. I think we just did a reprojection uh, on the what we're planning to do with the center. So I think the IRR is standing right now. We're projecting like a 40 plus percent IRR return uh, for the investors. Um, so for us, uh, crowdfunding plays a small piece in it. You know, I, I'm not sure where it's going to be uh, five years down the line because we've had this conversation about two years ago on a different <laughs> platform. Um, it, it seems like it's gone a little bit better where they can raise a little bit more money. Um, but as far as if you're looking for a $10 million equity check, you know, of just straight investors who can fit your profile on an investment, I'm not sure it's going to be there. Uh, it might be in the future when, if they open up all the regulations and stuff. But as of right now, it's probably not doable. I think the cap is, and you guys can probably answer this better than I can, yeah. it's probably like a million, two million bucks is kind of where everyone sits. Not, not on our platform. I'm actually interesting, interested to hear the, the small dollars that were raised. We, we actually won't do a raise under a million dollars. So we, we wouldn't do a $300,000 raise or a $500,000 raise. On average, our raises are running about three and a half million. So we, our sweet spot is one to five million when we fund JV equity. But... We, we just won't do anything as small as three or 500K. We can't make any money on it, frankly, right? There's, there's some point where as a company, you have to decide what you're gonna focus on. Um, and, and we've seen great success in that. You know, one of the limitations that I think you have when you structure in special purpose entities is that you're limited to 100 investors. And one of the things that we've focused on in our accredited investor business is finding wealthier investors. So our average investment from an accredited investor is $101,000 which gives you, I think, a lot more scale than maybe the experience that you had with another platform that has you know, smaller investment sizes and, and is writing smaller overall checks. Sure. Yeah, we're similar in that uh, we have a bigger range. We'll go all the way down to uh, 100,000, but we're completely on the debt side. The largest deal that we've done is 14.5 million. But to be honest, that didn't go to the crowd. That went to one of our institutional partners. The largest deal we funded through the crowd uh, was, was 4 million. But our sweet spot tends to be in that one to $2 million range at this point too. It's definitely grown. Uh, over the years, we start, our first deal was $140,000. The, the first year, our, our average size was sub 200,000. Second year, the average size was 600,000. And you know, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking north of a million on average sizes uh, this year. We can we can reliably raise at, at this point just from the crowd alone three to four million relatively easily. Yeah, you know, one other just comment on that. We actually have a sponsor who's in the room today who's one of our, our good clients, and we, we're close to doing about $15 million for them. Uh, we have another client who we've done about $10 million in transaction volume for as well. So I, I think the numbers are going up, right? Two years ago, I couldn't have said that. Two years ago, I would have said, you know, we did $2 million or a million. But I, I think is, you know, we see on a monthly basis we're adding thousands of net new investors. And, and it goes back to the point earlier in the, in the earlier panel around the entire population doesn't even know the term crowdfunding yet. So there's still a big educational challenge, but as more and more people learn about the concept and sign up and start sort of poking around these platforms, I, I think the deal sizes are gonna continue to go up. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a huge untapped market. Now, just kind of cutting to the meat of it, how long is it gonna take to raise the money and how much is it gonna cost? Because we've been seeing, just my experience, I've been seeing the pricing going down, which is nice, um, and you can raise it very quickly but as something was mentioned in the earlier panel, um, we haven't done crowdfunding for acquisitions. We've reverse syndicated because of confidentiality issues, and we don't like blasting our deals out to the market. So, well, you know. on our side, we're uh, um, we're a little bit of a hybrid. We use internal capital to pre-fund. So our you're deals. doing what we yeah. So we, done. we'll we'll vet yeah. the deal, and then uh, if it meets our credit guidelines, we'll we'll fund immediately. Our average uh, time to funding is about seven business days okay. at this point. 
we usually then immediately launch that to the crowd or to one of our institutional partners, uh, and then it's usually off our books within about 24 hours. And just so people understand the types of deals, obviously there's a wide spectrum of deals. It could be a construction deal, it could be you're buying a vacant box and you're retenanting it, but you don't have your tenant in tow, or it could be just a nice cash flowing deal. So in, in my experience, the crowd prefers cash flow. That's the best way. How do, how do you get deals done along the spectrum and what do they cost? Because we don't have a ton of time, so if you could just kind of bullet point. Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, our fix and flip deals, we, were, we operate under traditional lender mechanics where we've got a, a coupon that goes out to a rate to the, uh, the sponsor. That generally ranges uh, on our deals anywhere from about 9% up to, you know, the very high end, uh, about 14%. Um, Patch is a portal that sees a, a servicing strip of that. And then there's uh, lender origination, um, which are paid up front at time of closing. Uh, depending upon the deal, depending upon the risk profile, depending upon the asset and the, the borrower, uh, we're looking anywhere from between a half a point to four points on that at the very high end. Um, and then on the cash flowing deals, the, the ones that are debt servicing, so we, we offer now our, our midterm product for um, stabilized properties that have renters in place that are debt servicing. That ranges anywhere from 699 uh, as far as uh, a rate's concerned, up to at the high end about nine. Um, again, points are, are uh, a range on, on top of that. And that's the total coupon, so there's no look back IRR? No. That's, that's current pay. Right. So, so it's 9% for what, how much of the capital stack? So we'll, we'll actually fund up to um, uh, about 90% LTC on uh, the, uh, the stabilized properties. We don't like mm -hmm. to go that high. The, our, our biggest indicator of success for a, a borrower is to make sure they have skin in the game. So we'll go to generally about 80, but we, we will go to 90 if, uh, if the deal specifics make sense. Okay. And will you do a uh, kind of MAS prep equity? No, structure? we really don't. Okay, uh, so that's for, that side, yeah. that's yeah, for all the capital. We're pretty, yeah, we're pretty standardized in, in what we do. We want to make sure that we're able to be a volume uh, player. And we've got very, very specific uh, offerings that, that uh, we're working to scale. Okay. Jillian, what are your structures look like? Yeah, so we have four products. First product is senior debt. It's a point origination. So we're just like most other senior debt lenders. We're typically priced in the 6 to 9% range. So we're really focused on more bridgey value add kind of debt. We're not competing with your local bank. We're not competing with your local CMBS lender. On our next product, which is mezzanine debt, we charge two points, so two points origination. And our mezzanine is typically going to be priced in kind of the 9 to 11% range. And we're going to go up to 80% LTC on our MES product. Going up the capital stack, you have preferred equity. We're usually two points in, one point out on preferred equity. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. You're going to be in kind of the 10 to 12 or 10 to 13 percent range. That's going to go up to 85 percent of transaction. And then the most expensive and the most risky piece of the capital stack is going to be joint venture equity. That's going to be four points, and we're going to go up to 90 percent of the equity. Although the fee on the joint venture equity is a deal cost. So the same way that you're going to capitalize your lender costs if you're raising equity for a transaction, you're going to capitalize that cost in the deal. So there's, there's no out-of-pocket cost there. Really, the investors are bearing you know, a substantial piece of that cost. So for example, if we're 90% of the equity in a transaction, 90% of that fee is actually going to be paid by the capital that we're raising. Right? And the sponsor, if they have their own capital in the deal, is going to pay about 10% of that or 40 basis points of a 4% fee. Make sense? Oh. Greg, how does that compare to what you can? Yeah, so we're usually going to be 75 to 80 percent of acquisition cost, and then we probably do renovation and construction components to our loans, probably more than probably two thirds of the time. So we like the construction draws and allowing the uh, the borrower to pull that money out as they need it. Um, we're mostly in California, which is the most competitive state for private lending, as you know, Jason. So I haven't seen an 11 or 12 percent rate in two or three years. So we're, our rate's going to be somewhere in the eights. Tommy, topping out at about 10%. Um, we're probably, we, we are very flexible with term. So we'll do short, short durations, three months or less, if it's a very quick bridge, up to 18 month loans. And we price the origination points based on the time you need the money. So somewhere between one and probably three points is a good, good guide. We've done a little bit of MES recently, um, usually behind uh, very particular lenders who we've got a good relationship with. That might take us up to 85 or 90% of the cap stack with very, very 
sophisticated and experienced uh, operators. That's probably going to be similar rates here, is what Julian was saying, probably 12, 13 percent uh, similar points. Uh, we earn the points primarily as the, uh, you know, we, we, we manage commingled funds for our investors. Our investors get a piece of the points. We take a piece of the points. And then most of that coupon goes to our investors. We run funds with 8 and 10 percent preferred type of returns for our investors. Okay. So let's say I don't have the money. I do. But let's say I don't have the money to close with my own cash and reverse syndicate, which most people don't. So what is the execution risk going with a crowdfunding platform versus a traditional equity source where someone can just write a check? Um, Jillian? Yeah, we, we've done north of 200 transactions. There was one that we didn't close. So and, and how pretty, long? Pretty when did people? And the, and the one was like we were four months in business. So I counted against <laughs> us, but we, we didn't have a database, right? Okay. And you know, we I'd say 95% of our sponsors don't have the ability to close themselves. 95% of our business is acquisitions. Start to finish our process is about 40 days. And and again, we're strictly doing commercial real estate financing, so no residential, you know, none, none of the fast sort of fix and flip stuff. We do a lot of diligence, right? We we behave in in the diligence like a traditional private equity real estate firm. And uh, I think that, you know, the, the easiest way to get comfortable is to look at the track record of a platform, right? We're never going to tell a client we think we're going to be successful in your transaction unless we genuinely think we're going to be successful in their transaction. Uh, we also have a $35 million balance sheet, so we can back transactions with our own balance sheet. We never do, you know, guaranteed funding until obviously we've done all of our underwriting and all of our due diligence. And, that takes time, right? If we're equity, we're typically running in parallel with the senior lender. We're waiting on an appraisal. We're waiting on environmental. You know, just like any other joint venture equity partner, we're not going to give the sign off until we've actually finished underwriting. And in the nature of real estate, that doesn't happen. You know, it, it, it's all in a crunch, right? But we know up front where we think the underwriting is going to come out, and then we use all of the third parties really in confirmatory underwriting, just making sure that nothing comes up that's a surprise. Okay, so you're really acting like a traditional capital source, basically. And, yeah, and, and the I difference think is that we raise our capital on the internet. Yeah, but I think that's a little unusual for the crowd platforms. Um, the platform I used, basically, you know, we put, we put it out there. We raised the money very quickly. We raised it within a week, but it was less than a million dollars. So, um, but we, we took the risk. So if we couldn't raise the money, then, it, you know, it was on us. Whereas I think there's probably a lot more security when you go with a group that is acting more like a fund source. In our, in our world, Jason, you know this, our borrowers don't have 40 days and they have to go hard on their deposits. So we are, we've never not funded a deal. And you know, I think the strength and one of the reasons we're able to maybe charge what we charge is that we can move as you do. It might be three, five, seven, nine days. Our borrowers need quick decisions. Uh, there's no way these borrowers could close these acquisitions without us as a partner. And the banks can't move fast enough. So. I think that's really the, the reputation of what we have is there's never been a deal we haven't funded. And uh, you know, we have a, just under a $200 million balance sheet capacity. So our typical investment is about a million dollars. So you know, we have access to banks. We have our own capital. Um, and again, and we, have, you know, we have an ability to raise more capital should we need to. But you know, we're able to use our own balance sheet to be able to fund our investments. OK. And uh, well. We have, I think we have to do questions in about five minutes. I'm going to get to your questions. But quickly, how do, how do senior lenders feel about crowdsourced equity? Because I know I, I have that question. I, we actually did a CMBS loan. And we had to do the crowdfunding after we closed the CMBS a certain time after because the CMBS market really didn't like the idea of widely advertising the deal. Now, again, this was like 18 months ago, so maybe they're more used to it. But it is something to think about when you know, disclosing your equity source, because lenders kind of like to know where the equity is coming from. What experience have you had, Jonathan? Yeah, um, I think for us, I don't think lenders, frankly, care for the, I mean, they're not for it or against it. Um, I think as long as you can prove that they are credited, there's no, no issues there. It hasn't been an issue for us. And obviously, ours is a little bit different because ours is coming in as an SPV uh, into it. So you can't really penetrate into what the LLC of the, the SPV, what investors are in there. Um, so all they really see when in the structure, when they see it, is they see, you know, a half million, a million dollar investment, whatever it is. Uh, so to them, it's just an entity that's investing in it. So for us, I don't, I don't think lenders have ever caused an issue. Um, you know, to go back to the money you guys raised, the one thing I would say, I, I think as sponsors, um, we're always looking for 
the cheapest equity, right? And debt, to be frank, is a commodity at this point. Anyone can get debt with a pulse, pretty much. Um, you're looking for the equity that's going to fit your structure. Um, for us, we have a we try to keep our the equity costs very low. Um, to give you an idea, like we have a JV with Inland. Uh, it's obviously a big REIT. Um, as you guys can imagine, the REITs they charge an uh, arm and a leg um, for their capital. I mean, some of their costs from some of the subscriptions agreements we've seen to go up to 14 to 16% on cost of capital. So, I mean, you're, you're walking into a deal, if you don't push the rents up, you're not gonna make money at that point. Um, so for us, yeah, I think raising two to three million dollars is pretty, pretty impressive, to be frank. Um, the thing is, for us, we have, the cost of capital for us at that point is too high on that kind of stuff. Um, so we're not looking for something just to be frank, I mean, we, our company doesn't put any MES debt on anything, and our LTV usually never crosses 65 LTV. Um, so for us to get to you know, the high teen returns that a lot of people are looking for in this market today, you have to push the LTV up to like 85 or 80 plus percent. That's the only way to do it. Um, and at that point, you know, we're gonna see, I mean, a knock on wood, you know, one, a deal's gonna go bad on one of these platforms and we're gonna have to see what happens at that point? You know, where, where does the crowd follow in that point? Um, and see what happens to the downturn. Because right now, I mean, if you invested, I think we were just talking about earlier, if you invested anything in the last three years, if you didn't make money, you don't know what the heck you're doing, just to be frank. Okay, so quickly, I just wanna go down the line, and nobody can repeat what the last person said. Biggest advantage and disadvantage of crowdfunding. Jonathan, we'll start with you. I'll go last. Yeah, I think no the, repetition. Yeah, the advantage <laughs> is saving time, obviously. I mean, especially if someone is going out to raise the capital for you via the crowd. I think the biggest disadvantage is if it doesn't happen, if you're counting on the money and it doesn't happen, what do you do then? Especially if you don't have a credit line to close a deal or something. Yeah, I think the biggest advantage for sponsors in particular, maybe just because there's a lot of sponsors in the room, is you get to focus on what you're really good at and why you started your companies, right? I, I imagine you started your companies because you love real estate, you love acquiring real estate, you love operating real estate. You may not love country club dinners five nights a week, right? And, and so we, we're specialists in raising capital. We're, we're not specialists necessarily in operating, you know, your retail shopping center. And, and so by outsourcing your capital markets to a crowdfunding platform, you can focus on presumably what you love and what you're really, really good at. I, I think the disadvantage is that you are relying on the underlying investors of that platform, and those investors really have an allegiance to that platform, right? Our, our investors are investing multiple times on our platform across a number of different sponsors, so they're not strictly your investors, right? But if you think about collaborative consumption and shared resources and, you know, one plus one equals three when you're sharing people, you know, I, I view that as a positive, but some could view it as a negative that you don't have a direct relationship with that investor. On my side, I think the, uh, the biggest advantage of crowdfunding is the flexibility that it affords you. Um, so I, we have a, a traditional um, East Coast fund. Uh, they, they've granted us about 250 million, but they've got a credit box that's like this. Um, I've got thousands and thousands of active highly sophisticated accredited investors on the platform that have a credit box like this. Um, so there's different degrees of risk appetite, there's different degrees of sophistication, there's different degrees of value that they're placing on each individual uh, project. So we have the ability to get deals done that would be outside of a, a very narrow box that some of the, you know, the, that maybe Wall Street may dictate, but that are still good deals nonetheless. And we do all of our underwriting, so we're not going to put crap up on the the, uh, the page. The biggest disadvantage I can see, realistically, uh, you know, for crowdfunding, one of the biggest disadvantages is your credibility risk. Um, you know, you're putting things out online and bringing it out to thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people over the internet. If you don't perform, um, things become public. So you have to keep that in mind. I think the biggest advantage is simply being able to expose as a successful operator what you do and your individual investments to a, a, a brand new audience. So um, when I started my development, I had you know, 50 investors, all of them I'd met with. It wasn't country club, but it was friends, you know, introductions, raising that capital. It would have been nice to put out deals and not had to do that. I spent an enormous amount of time building that. Now that I've built it, it's a great asset. but could have done a lot more deals if I didn't have to do that. So having that exposure, I think, is fantastic. I think the biggest disadvantage, and I've seen this happen again and again, I think every platform's different, is things don't always work out exactly the way you want them to work out with. 
I've probably re refinanced five or six loans this year that were 12-month loans on various crowdfunding platforms that couldn't get extensions or couldn't get reasonable extensions. The, you know, San Francisco deal where the city slowed up a permit and next thing they knew they needed another six to nine months. On the crowd, I don't know how that happens. I think every platform handles it different. With me, they talk to me or one of my origination team, we go through the situation, we re-underwrite it, and we give them an extension if we need to give them an extension. Having a person to talk to and being able to work things out, it's been a great real estate market the last few years, as you were saying, Jonathan. Really, really hard as a debt lender to lose money unless you make a big, big mistake. Next five years may be very different. There's gonna be workouts, there's gonna be bad loans. I just don't know how the individual platforms, I know you're all thinking about it, I don't know how that's gonna work for the sponsor. They're gonna need, they're gonna need a, a helping hand, they're gonna need maybe a little flexibility. I just don't know if it involves hundreds of investors what, what that's gonna entail. Okay, I'm gonna go global here. Um, I think potentially the, the, the ability to disrupt the capital markets, uh, crowdfunding could get other capital sources to become more flexible and cheaper. Hence, you could do a crowdfunding deal or you could do a traditional fund deal and say, well, I could go and I could get the money for the crowd for 9% or I could get it for you. So it will ultimately, because it's bringing more capital to the markets in general, and this isn't necessarily happening this year, but five or 10 years from now, it could basically create a, a broader market and make commercial real estate capital cheaper, which I think it should be in general. Um, so that's a huge advantage. Disadvantage for anybody that gets involved in an industry in its infancy, and a Madoff event does occur, we could all get swept away with it. <laughs> so that could be a kind of a scary thing. But, you know, you, you, you got to do business. <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm going to open it up to questions now. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Let's say that um, you had to step in the sh into the shoes of the sponsor as the uh, prep equity um, service the debt. Do you step into the carve-outs? How does that, um, the lender carve-outs? It, it depends on the deal, right? We have certain transactions where in our prep equity documents, if there's a changeover event, we have to sell the asset, right? So the decision is that we sell the asset and we look to get the lender out first, obviously. Um, there are other legal documentation, really, it really depends on the lender, right? Is it behind CMBS debt? Is it behind life company? Is it behind bank? Uh, there are some situations where we would have to if we take on that liability, right? So we, we'd have a choice in a changeover event to take on the liability to say, either we're going to put the asset up for sale in the next six months or eight months, or we're not going to put up the asset up for sale. We're going to step into the shoes of the sponsor, um, and we're going to take on a piece of that liability. So it's, it's really on a situation by situation basis. And it depends on the lender, right? It's the flexibility of the lender. Obviously, we go in with stock documents. Some lenders, like regional banks, you can usually get pretty good docs. Um, CMBS, you're not going to get good docs, right? It's going to be your, your generic docs. Fannie and Freddie, if you're doing pref behind Fannie and Freddie, they have standard soft pref equity documents. They're really not, not, not negotiable, right? They're, they're slated in the market, and they've been used for a long period of time. So documents really depend on the senior. In many situations, we do. In every situation, we can't. I mean, prior to anything happening. Yeah, yeah, in many situations, we do. But it, again, it depends on the senior lender. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, in the back. For those of you that have institutional funding sources as well as crowdfunding sources, how do you allocate? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, dollar size, equity size is a, is a big part of it for us. And we've only used the crowd once because of the check size and because we only reverse syndicate. So if you need, if you don't want to put $10 million of your own cash in to close and you, you don't want to advertise your deal, then you typically can't go to the crowd. So you have to have institutional capital partners. Or what we do is we actually have one individual that writes a preferred equity check, and then we put the rest of the cash in, and then you could potentially reverse syndicate afterwards part of the equity. So for us, it typically doesn't work, just it really it has to do with dollar size. So. Uh, yeah, credit box differences, um, but where there's overlap, 
know, it's one of our biggest challenges, honestly. Our, our crowd wants to make sure that we're not cherry picking to give to, to Wall Street and, and vice versa. Right? It, it's, it's been a significant concern. It's going to continue to be a significant concern as we grow from you know, doing 20 million a month to 50 million to 100 million a month. Um, realistically, right now, we, we, we do our best to operate in a round robin basis when we have overlap between the two credit boxes. Now, as I mentioned before, our institutional um, uh, partners tend to have much more narrow credit boxes. That's why I mentioned in certain cases, we, we try and stay right around 80% LTC, but in certain cases, we can go up to 90 if there are mitigating circumstances and so on. There's no way my institutional partners can be able to take that, but I do have a set group of um, you know, retail investors that, that would love that particular deal, in which case it just, it, it's a, an easy decision there. But when we have the, relatively the same type of uh, um, credit box, we'll try and move it around Robin, but overall we'll try and saturate the, uh, um, the appetites. Uh, you know, my, my institution will take 20 million a month from us. My crowd right now at most, I mean, uh, is quite honestly probably about 15 million a, a month is what I can do right now. It's been growing significantly. But if I've already given my crowd 15 million a month, and we have additional, uh, uh, you know, demand that that or supply that's uh, um, in that particular credit box, then we'll allocate that to uh, the institution. Yes. Do any of your platforms uh, work on tax credit um, pass-throughs, um, low-income, um, new market tax credits, historic tax credits, renewables? Um, when, when when you work through deals. I haven't seen it. Yeah, we've done some stuff like that. We're working on a deal actually in, uh, actually I can't mention it because it's a 506B, but we're working on a deal that's got some tax credit stuff with it right now. Uh, and then there's also depreciation, right? So when you think about, you know, one of the benefits of structuring in an SPE is that we can do pass-through depreciation for our investors. And we negotiate that. So we'll, we'll negotiate, you know, typically a peri pursued depreciation that we can use as a write down on the K-1s that we send out to our investors. When, when you have wealthy investors, it's really meaningful, right, if they have current income. But yeah, we, we've done some, um, some tax credit stuff. We've also done a number of transactions where there's rent control, both in New York City and, and here in Los Angeles. Uh, and there's advantages and disadvantages to that. Obviously, you're underwriting sort of a different level of risk. We, we have a New York office who's done a lot of work around particularly the legislation in New York. And obviously, we're, we're very familiar here locally in Los Angeles being here and, and sort of being engrossed in the real estate business here. But we absolutely will look at, at tax credit. Okay. I think we have to wrap it up now. And I've been told to tell you that the, the roundtables are going to be here. Here? <laughs> <laughs> around here. The small, the small round table. <laughs> the small, oh, the small round table. Okay, there we go. So thank you all, um, and we'll be around if you have more questions later. Thank you. Good to see you, Jason. Good to see you. Good nice to see you, Jonathan.